Hello people, welcome back to another video from Eleven Lessons Online. I'm going to be covering physical geography again. Alright, this time we're going to be covering part 20, okay, on drainage basin hydrology, the factors affecting it, as well as the water balance. Okay, the water balance, I'll be going through in, in brief only in this video. If you want a more in-depth video whereby I go through the graphs and everything, okay, be sure to let me know in the comment section below, and I'll go through that as well. Alright, so in the previous part, okay, part 19, I'll leave a link in the top right-hand corner of the screen. I've already briefly gone through, not even briefly, actually, actually I've gone through uh, in depth. Okay, I mean briefly for factors, but in depth in terms of your, your inputs, output, your flows, and your, your storages, right? So in this video, I'm going to be covering more in detail on what are certain factors they need to take note of that have affected the drainage basin hydrology, okay? If you have already picked up some clues from the previous video, good for you. If not, I will try my best to go through um, in detail, in depth in this video for you to understand so that when it comes to writing essays, these, are will, these will be what will form your explanation and your analysis. All right, so jumping right in. Okay, first, the first factor we have is climate. Okay, as we all know, right, climate tends to be basically the biggest um, factor for almost everything, be it cast, aeolian, um, hydrological cycle, your, your ITCZ, atmospheric uh, circulations. The reason why is because climate is a global, it's a global factor, right? It affects everyone on an entirely global scale, right? Everyone experiences rainfall, everyone experiences uh, uh, different temperatures, right? And it consists of rainfall and temperature, which are huge macro factors. Okay, so the first factor is going to be climate, I bet in the form of rainfall. Oh, why is it? Give me a second. Okay, in the form of rainfall. Okay, so essentially rainfall very, very simply determines the amount of rainfall available and how much water will be transferred from each storage. Okay, so be it from your, your input to your, to your infiltration to your percolation all the way to your soil moisture storage. Okay, basically rainfall determines how much water is going to be going on in this um, hydrological cycle. Okay, for instance, if there's a lack of rainfall, right, surely there'll be a lack of infiltration and hence there'll be a lack of soil moisture storage, a lack of percolation, a lack of base flow, um, a lack of groundwater storage, right? And on the other hand, vice versa, if there was high rainfall, it would be called the complete opposite. Okay, so you notice that right off the bat, right, rainfall is really one of the more important factors, in fact, the most important because without rainfall, there won't even be an input. Without an input, there won't be flows, there won't be storages, there won't be um, an output as well. So rainfall in the form of your input has already had this domineering, very controlling factor over the entire drainage basin hydrology that it cannot live without. Okay, next one I've got temperature. Okay, temperature determines the rate of evaporation uh, rate of evaporation and transpiration. Okay, so this part basically is referring to your output. So you notice that both temperature and rainfall kind of already overlap, whereby they affect every single one of your different parts of the drainage basin hydrology in terms of your input, your output, your flows, your storages is all affected be it by rainfall or temperature. Hence, this is why climate is one of the more important, in fact, the most important factor in the drainage basin hydrology. Okay, next I've got vegetation cover, right? All of us know what vegetation cover is. Basically, different characteristics of vegetation cover will influence the amount of interception. Here in the form of interception loss, I've contributed in my previous video. Okay, evapotranspiration, infiltration, and overland flow. So your flow storages output, they're all affected by vegetation as well. So the more vegetation there is, actually like a huge Amazon forest, right? Whereby there's a lot of interception loss. Okay, chances are there's going to be less water hitting the ground. Hence, there could be less infiltration. And then as a result, less percolation, less and less of all your storages. So depending on how big the size of your leaves are, so as you saw, you can see over right here, the surface area of leaves and the density of ve vegetation. Okay, the more vegetation there is and the bigger the area of the leaves are, chances are there'll be more water which is stored on this vegetation cover. And hence, there is lesser water which will actually be inside the drainage basin hydrology. By, be, by, by talking about inside, I mean your soil moisture storage, your groundwater storage, and all the relevant flows that are in the, the drainage basin um, hydrological cycle. Alright, then next I've got soil moisture conditions. This is something that could be new to some of you. Okay, basically different antecedent moisture conditions affect the infiltration. Okay, red is a bit dark. Let's use yellow. Okay, different antecedent moisture conditions will affect infiltration, percolation, and overland flow. Okay, basically the higher the soil in, uh, antecedent moisture, the lesser the available pore spaces and it reduces the infiltration capacity, right? And can lead to saturation, hence permeability as well. Okay, what is soil antecedent moisture? 
Soil antecedent moisture, for those of you who those of you who don't know, is basically how dense is the soil as a result of the previous rainfall. Okay, so usually a uh, uh, area with a very, very high soil antecedent moisture tends to indicate that there was an extremely high amount of uh, downpour or rainfall right before that, that before it was measured. You know what I mean? Okay, because what actually happens is that when there's a period of high rainfall, a lot of water is stored in the ground. And when there's a lot of water that is stored in the ground, this water takes a while to channel out in terms of your output, right? It takes a while to get to the river channel. But if, let's say, it suddenly rains again, Okay, chances are your soil is already saturated, which means that it has a very high soil antecedent moisture, okay, because there's already a lot of water trapped inside. Hence, there are basically no pore spaces for the new the new rainfall to actually infiltrate, and hence this can lead to higher overland flow. So you notice that in this case, your soil antecedent moisture condition can actually affect not only your infiltration, it can affect your percolation, because the percolation is always affected by infiltration, but it can also affect overland flow. Okay, because when there is, is when there are when the soil antecedent moisture is very high as a result of the previous rainfall, once again your ground is saturated, hence the water will actually flow on top in form in the form of saturation uh, saturated overland flow instead. You get what I mean? Okay, if you don't get it, please play it back. This is a very, very important concept you need to understand and grasp. Okay, then I've got the soil and rock type. Okay, the extent of porosity and permeability will affect the subsurface and overland flows. So essentially what I'm trying to say over here is that the, the soil and rock type is very, very important because um, depending on what it is, right, it can lead to more pore spaces or lesser permeability or less pore spaces and more permeability or both. Okay, they can work together as well. Okay, so the more porous the rocks, the greater the infiltration capacity. This is what I've gone through in the previous video. The greater the permeability, the greater the infiltration rate. Okay, essentially what happens here is that when the when there are a lot of pore spaces in the rock, there are a lot of all these air bubbles. Okay, it's, there's going to be a huge amount of space for water to actually infiltrate. And hence, this means that there's a greater amount of room for infiltration to occur, hence a higher infiltration capacity. Okay, on the other hand, the greater the permeability, that means how permeable the surface is, the soil is, for water to seep in, it will result in a greater infiltration rate. So if the rocks are not porous and not permeable, it will lead to greater le- greater overland flow, okay? Because the ground will essentially reach infiltration, maximum infiltration capacity and infiltration rate very, very soon, and hence the water cannot go into the soil anymore, and hence they will just flow on top in the form of Hawthornian overland flow. Okay, I've gone through this in the previous video, go check it out, all right? Okay, then we need to give duality, right? So I'm going to bring in human activities as well. So, anthropogenic activities are also known as human activities. For instance, urbanization, okay, whereby when they introduce concrete surfaces, it will result in lesser permeability, right? Because concrete surfaces, there isn't really much room for water to actually seep in. Okay, and this results in lesser infiltration and hence greater overland flow in the form of your Hawthornian overland flow, HOF. Okay, moreover, there could also be water abstraction from grounds, okay, especially the older, cli- uh, older countries, older cities. Okay, this will affect groundwater flow as well, okay, because you're digging all the way to the bottom of the water table. Okay, and this will also affect your channel flow because water is being extracted. Okay, then we move on to the water balance. Okay, what exactly is the water balance? Okay, the water balance equation is essentially P equals to Q plus E plus minus S. Okay, it basically determines the relationship between input and output. Okay, so whenever I've got my water balance equation, I usually use it as a form of evaluation to show that why a higher level of precipitation will lead to a higher level of stream flow, evaporation and transpiration, and possible, possibly higher changes in storage. You get what I mean, right? So it's basically like using math to kind of like justify your, your, your argument. Okay, so just take note of this equation, okay? I will go through in, an, uh, in, in, in another video if, if requested, okay, on how you should exactly be using this in your essay. But if not, try to make use of this, okay, because it's actually quite a good equation to use to show the water balance in the drainage basin hydrology. Okay, so it can also show that there are surpluses or deficits in the drainage basin hydrology. Okay, when P more than E, which basically means your precipitation more than evapotranspiration, this will lead to a surplus. Okay, a surplus of what? Okay, a surplus of water in the drainage basin hydrology, right? Because there's more water coming in, there's more input, than more water leaving. So, of course, there'll be more water that will be inside the drainage basin hydrology, leading, leading to a surplus. Okay, so this will lead to more overland flows, because not a lot of water can, may be able to go in, but it also lead to more groundwater storage, etc. Okay, so go and figure out how it affects your storages and your flows. 
On the other hand, when P is more, when E is more than P, that means your, your output is more than your input. Okay, this will lead to a water deficit. Makes sense, right? So there will be a water deficit in the drainage basin hydro hydrology, hence leading to a lower water table and lesser percolation, lesser infiltration, lesser of everything that's inside. Okay, so go ahead and understand the water balance equation, figure out how it affects the different parts okay, of your drainage basin hydrology, and it will surely help you out a lot. Alright, so let's conclude, okay, back to exam requirements, okay. Firstly, you need to understand, explain, and be able to discuss the various factors which affect your drainage basin hydrology. I've already gone through this. This is your climate, your human activity, soil and desert moisture. Go ahead and look through this video again if you need to, if you're unsure. Okay, and always use your criteria to justify. Okay, I've already gone through this in the previous video. Okay, I will leave a link in the top corner of the screen. Okay, understand the water balance equation and use it as a form of evaluation to justify variations in the flows stores input and output when discussing the drainage basin hydrology okay so when you use the water balance equation okay basically what we use the water balance equation for is to simply justify our current argument at hand okay is it actually flawed or is it not okay because the water balance equation will prove that a higher level of precipitation will lead to higher levels of everything so it's just an added evaluation that examiners like to see in your essays okay to show that you're thinking more than what the syllabus actually requires you to do Okay, so if not, that's actually all I've, I would I'd like to go through for this part on factors for drainage basin hydrology and your water balance. Okay, if, like I said, okay, if you need more help on this, okay, leave a comment down below. I'll be, I'll, I'll make sure I'll create another video for you guys, um, which covers more on water balance. All right, so if not, that's actually all I have. Okay, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Okay, it does help me out a lot. As well as to subscribe to the channel, okay, for uh, more interesting videos which will be coming soon. Okay, I, I have a whole lineup this year for a lot of job content and econs and general paper as well, which should be coming very, very soon. Okay, um, if not, that is actually all I have. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.